My name is Paul Bergman. I'm the president of World Class Productivity. I'd like to welcome everybody to the webinar, PMBOK Guide 6th Edition, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Your speaker for the session is Kieran Bondale. Kieran is a senior consultant and partner with World Class Productivity. Kieran has almost 20 years of experience in both traditional and agile project management. He has set up and managed a number of project management offices and has provided project portfolio management and project management consulting services to over 100 clients across multiple industries. Kieran is a regular speaker at project management conferences, and his articles on project and project portfolio management appear in both project management and industry-specific journals. Kieran also has a weekly project management blog, which frequently ranks as one of the top 50 project management blogs. In addition to having his project management professional designation, Kieran also has an Agile Certified Practitioner designation for the Project Management Institute, PMI, and the Certified Discipline Agile Practitioner, CDAP, and Certified Discipline Agile Instructor, CDAI, credential from the Discipline Agile Consortium. Kieran is a highly energetic, articulate, and enthusiastic facilitator who brings a pragmatic value-focused approach to project management methodology and governance. So without further ado, please welcome Kieran Bondale. Thanks, Paul. Welcome everybody to our, our presentation on the changes that we're experiencing with the new version of the PMBOK guide. Before I launch into the content, I would just like to go over some webinar logistics with you. First of all, as you've probably noticed, uh, Paul and I are the only two people on the line that are uh, able to speak or whose voices are being heard to ensure a quality experience for everyone. We do, however, have a Q&A capability. So uh, in your Ring Central uh, toolbar, which should be available either at the top of your screen or the bottom of your screen, you'll notice there's a Q&A button. So in case you have any questions about any of the content that I'll be covering over the course of the webinar, feel free to click on that button, type in the information, and when we get to the end of the session, Paul will be uh, curating or will be moderating those questions and I will answer them uh, in order that which they were entered. We also are gonna try to get a little bit of audience participation going. We have some polls that we've set up through the webinar. Um, when those polls are launched, uh, you'll be given about 15 to 20 seconds to provide your answers. Uh, once you've done that as a group, I will be sharing the feedback with everyone. So what's on our agenda for today's webinar? Well, first of all, I wanna go through some basic 101 type information about the new edition of the PMBOK Guide. From there, we're gonna dive into really the core of the content, which is what's changed. I'm gonna go through some macro level changes. These are probably ones that you might have heard of through some of the lead up to the actual launch of the new guide in early September. I'm gonna go through some of the changes that impact the introductory chapters of the guide, and then do a deep dive into the knowledge area based changes. So go through each of our 10 knowledge areas and highlight what has changed between the fifth edition and the sixth edition. Finally, I'm gonna close out by looking at what it does this really mean to us? What is the impact of the changes, both in terms of the impact to organizations that might be aligning their approaches or their standards with the PMBOK, as well as what does it mean for those of you that might be considering acquiring or getting a PMI designation? So to start off with, let's go ahead and do our first poll. So for this poll, I'd like to get a sense as to how many of you have actually downloaded the new version of the PMBOK guide, or if you prefer hard copy, how many of you have gone out and purchased the hard copy version of the PMBOK guide and started to go through it? Okay, let me go ahead and end the polling and share those results. So what we can see is that uh, the majority of you, uh, about uh, two thirds, have not uh, downloaded a copy of the, uh, the new guide yet. Uh, maybe you're waiting for this webinar to decide to do so. Um, about uh, half of the balance, so maybe about a sixth or so, uh, have downloaded but haven't started to read it yet. And the remaining have downloaded and skimmed through it, but nobody's actually read it cover to cover, which isn't too surprising because we're talking about a document that is now upwards of uh, 700 pages. And when you throw in the new Agile Practice Guide, which was bundled along with it when you download the soft copy, you're tipping the scales at about 1,000 pages. 
Okay, so uh, on the left there, you can see a little fun fact, which is the PEMBOT Guide V6, it is about 30% larger than the previous version. But what's interesting is that if you happen to purchase the hard copy version, uh, I got mine from uh, a local Canadian uh, book company chapters, um, it actually seems to be thinner. When I stack it next to my version five, it's actually thinner. And the reason being, they've actually used thinner paper. So um, I don't know if that was a cost saving me measure on the part of PMI or their publishers, but it actually looks thinner even though it's actually thicker. What do we want to know about the PEMBOT Guide V6? Well, it was published on September 6th, so it's just over a month old by now. Um, there you can see the size difference. It's 756 pages for the, uh, the PEMBOT Guide V6 compared to the 588 pages which we had for the previous version 5 edition. When you download a soft copy, so for PMI members, as you probably know, it's a free download copy for PMI members. Along with the PEMBOT guide, they have bundled in, in the same document, a copy of the Agile Practice Guide. The Agile Practice Guide is a brand new practice guide that happened to be developed concurrently with the PEMBOT guide. Uh, and it was developed in partnership between PMI, or team of volunteers at PMI, and the Agile Alliance. So really trying to bring together two worlds, the world of traditional project management and really one of the foremost associations that is championing the cause of Agile, those two groups got together to develop this practice guide. And the practice guide is really intended to be a version one. There, there's absolute an, an intention to continue to evolve it over time. I'm not actually going to delve into the Agile practice guide at all. Potentially, that might be the topic for a future webinar. We're going to be focusing on the PEMBOT guide itself. But suffice to say that when you download PEMBOT guide from PMI's website, you get the Agile Practice Guide appended on the end of that PDF. And as is the case with most of PMI's official standards or practice guides, when you download it, you're actually requested or uh, required to provide your PMI member credentials. What they do is they watermark the PDF copy that you download with your name. Um, so that way, in case you try to share it with a friend of yours, they'll know where it came from. On top of that, you'll notice that uh, a number of the PDF editing type capabilities, things like being able to do a copy and a copy or to be able to print, those are disabled. So again, to protect their intellectual property, they do have some of those features disabled. So what are some of the high level changes that we see, the macro level changes between version five and version six? So as you know, in version six, there used to be a knowledge area known as project time management. They've gone ahead and renamed that to project schedule management. The logic being, or the rationale being, um, as project managers, we can't really manage time. As you know, time never stops, it keeps on ticking. What we do have control over, what we are able to plan and then manage is our project schedule. So they just wanted to be a little clearer about that or a little more accurate with regards to that description. The knowledge area project human resource management was renamed to project resource management. And that was, the rationale for that was really to broaden the scope of resource management to go beyond the people that we need to deliver our projects to also consider other types of resources, material resources, for example very small renaming. What they used to call analytical techniques in version five has now got renamed to data analysis. So pretty minor that way. But they've actually now added in a bunch of stuff. There's a whole new chapter that's been added, which focuses on the role of the project manager. Really a good chapter to read. It provides really good insights into some of the leadership capabilities, the soft skills that are needed on the part of a PM. Uh, very, very valuable addition, I would say. In addition, for every one of the 10 knowledge areas, they've added four new sections. They've added or they've augmented the introductory concepts, which had been there before. They're now calling it key concepts, and they've added quite a bit of information to really help people understand what is this knowledge area all about? Why is it important? How does it fit into the big picture? I found that that was very useful because what I used to find in earlier versions of the PEMBOT guide, that some of the knowledge areas which practitioners may not have had as much hands-on experience with, they might have been scratching their heads thinking about about, well, what's this all about? And PMI would very rapidly jump into the processes and the inputs, tools, and techniques, and outputs without providing some of that uh, lead in or some of that initial preamble. So they've done a good job of broadening the understanding as to what is the, of each of these knowledge areas. A section that I really liked was the trends and emerging practices. 
What that section is about in each knowledge area is to say that if we think about, for example, schedule management, what are some of those trends that we're seeing when it comes to developing schedules or managing schedules on your projects? So they've done a little bit of research into, well, what's kind of the bleeding edge out there? What are some of those emerging practices? And they've captured a bit of information. Now, it's not intended to be a very detailed coverage of those. It's really more of almost a teaser, I would say, or a trailer to whet people's appetite to say, hey, this sounds interesting. Maybe I want to learn more about it. A third section that they've added, and this is, again, one which I think is very valuable, and I think they, you'll see it improve or continue to be elaborated in the future, is tailoring considerations. One of the critical components that has been mentioned in the PEMBOT guide from the first edition, but that they haven't really put a lot of meat behind in previous editions, was that concept that project management is not one size fits all. Even though the project management body of knowledge is a framework, which specific practices, tools, and techniques a particular practitioner will apply to the context of a given project and the culture of their organization and team, those will vary widely. And so what PMI's tried to do in this section for each of the knowledge areas is to try to provide some food for thought, some criteria to think about when you're looking at tailoring your approach. So they're giving you a list of the factors, a list of the conditions that you might want to consider as you're deciding how heavy or how light your approach to each knowledge area should be. Now, the reason that I say I view this as being a first step in the right direction is that I believe where they can go with this is to actually provide some tailoring advice. So for example, if we have a particular criteria, and if based on that we say, well, we're coming on the low end of the scale, then maybe they could provide some advice to say, well, if you're in this particular context, here's what you might want to use from a tool or a technique or an output or an input perspective. If they were to go that direction, I think you would start to see the PEMBOT guide starting to really be used as a solid basis to enable organizations to develop scalable methodologies. And the final section that they've added, which again, I view as being really a good first step, is considerations for agile and adaptive environments. So recognizing that the, that the history of the PEMBOK guide has predominantly focused on large projects that are delivered in a fairly deterministic or predictive type manner, they've recognized that Agile now has gone beyond the walls of technology projects and is now being used in all different kinds of industries. And hence, they're looking at seeing how can Agile principles and values be baked into each of the knowledge areas? How can we adapt our approach to be more Agile when we're dealing with a project, whether or not it's being delivered using an Agile delivery methodology? Again, I view this as a good first step. They could certainly go into a lot further detail, but this is where I believe the Agile Practice Guide, which was released at the same time as the new edition of the PEMBOK Guide, that's where I see it will evolve over time and provide more and more good information that will tie the knowledge areas to Agile adaptability. So that's a quick coverage of some of the macro changes. Let's start to now go through our individual areas within the PEMBOK Guide itself. Before I do that, I want to touch on what I consider to be the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good, new, we've got those new sections. I think that's a really good idea. Those four new sections really provide some value. The piece or the, the section that I'm the most positive about is those emerging practices. I was very impressed by the quality of the material around those emerging practices. One of the things that I, that I didn't really like about the old edition of the PEMBA guide was that there was a little bit of inconsistency. In many cases, they would refer to the component plans of the project management plan, for example, the scope management plan or the risk management plan or the quality management plan as being process inputs, whereas in other places, they would call out the project management plan. They've now tried to address that inconsistency by referencing or leveraging the project management plan as an input, recognizing that there's often multiple components of it which can act as an input to a given process. They've provided a lot of examples. So whereas they had not necessarily given a lot of ideas as to what are some tools or techniques or what are some examples of 
outputs. Um, they had used more generic terms in earlier editions of the PEMBOK guide. They've provided a lot of examples of sample tools, techniques, inputs, and outputs, and they've tried to make those examples span multiple different industries as opposed to just focusing on construction or just focusing on technology. So I found that that was pretty positive as well because that'll help to make it resonate more with project managers across a variety of different industries. They did add three processes. So we're now in a situation where we've gone up from 47 processes. They've now added three useful processes and you'll see them when we get into the details of the knowledge areas. And the other thing I noticed is whereas before, there tended to be a bit of an overlap and even some inconsistency between the PEMBOK guide and some of their other standards and practice guides, they've tried to address that. They've stripped out some of the overlap and they're, they're actually doing call outs to some of their other standards and practice guides, trying to really get a sense of an ecosystem of knowledge repositories versus the PEMBOK guide being kind of the capstone and then these other guides as being more bolt-ons. They're now starting to really show the references and the integration between them, which I, which I found was really valuable. So that's what I thought was good. Well, what don't I like as much? Well, one of the challenges that I see, and I think this is really going to be a challenge from perspective of people that are looking at earning a PMI designation of some kind, as well as people that are in the business of teaching or coaching or consulting using the PMBOK, is that they have done a reasonable amount of changes to process names and ITTOs. So while I believe some of those changes were probably legitimate, in some cases, it did feel that they were just renaming for the sake of renaming. One of the, uh, the aspects which surprised me was they really reduced the amount of coverage on project management offices. Now, as folks that follow me on LinkedIn will know, I'm certainly not a blind proponent of PMOs. They have their place as long as they have solid rationale behind their initiation and they justify their value. I'm in favor of them, but because there are still a lot of PMOs out there, there's still a very popular method of generating or supporting control around project management practice, it's weird that they would reduce the amount of coverage within the PMBOK guide on PMOs. So that was a little bit of a surprise for me. The Agile Adaptive Considerations section in each knowledge area, it is very light. If I was a practitioner that was new to Agile, I don't know that I could rely purely on that content to help me get a good grounding in how do, does each knowledge area change when you're facing an Agile delivery approach. It does need to be expanded, and potentially that's what they see the Agile Practice Guide as being the answer to. This is where I'm really unhappy. They dropped some key tools and techniques that I felt were of great value. Pareto diagrams and the whole coverage of the Pareto principle doesn't show up. To me, that is unfortunate because the concept of focusing on the vital few and putting aside the trivial many is something that I think as project managers, we constantly have to keep in our heads. And yet they decided to drop that by the wayside. Critical chain method, which again, I mean, you could be for it or against it, but it does provide one answer to handling the challenge of being resource constrained, especially in a multi-project environment. They dropped all references to that. And then Delphi, which to me was one of those fundamental techniques that we learn in any type of group decision making to be able to overcome bias, they removed references to that. This bothered me quite a bit because these three are all techniques that I've certainly spoken highly about. I've referenced them quite a bit when I've been teaching and I've been able to use them practically when I've been a practitioner managing projects or supporting or leading PMOs. This seemed to me a little bit unfortunate that they would drop those. Now this is potentially maybe more of a pet peeve of mine, but if you happen to buy the hard copy version, you'll notice it uses very thin paper. I'm not a fan of that because I like dog earing my copies of the PEMBOK guide. I like putting sticky pages, stickies against them. I'll underline content, I'll highlight content. The thinner the page, the more likely it's gonna rip. So I don't know if this is a ploy on PMI's part to be able to get people to buy multiple copies of the PEMBOK guide until they release a new edition. On top of that, it's gray paper, and the rationale behind that is actually that the paper they've used and the color of that paper prevents you from being able to photocopy it. Um, 
that's great, that helps them protect their intellectual capital, but at the same point, it does make it a little bit less readable. The other aspect I found that I wasn't a fan of is that the knowledge areas uh, are missing from the top of each page. So if you're in the middle of a chapter and you've lost track of which knowledge area this was in the previous versions of the PEMBOT guide, you could tell, oh, I'm in a risk management chapter 11, great. You've lost that information. So that's also a little bit unfortunate. It wouldn't have, I would say, taken them a lot of effort to include those sorts of usability conditions. Okay, so what, have we, what do we see happening in the PEMBOT guide itself, chapter by chapter? In the introductory chapters, so those are sort of your first three chapters, there's a lot of content added around the value and importance of project management, as well as the criticality of phase gates. I found that really great. I mean, I think one of the challenges we all face as practitioners in this profession is selling the value and the importance of project management. So now they've provided some good content that we can reference. They've also highlighted the concept of phase gates as a great opportunity to ensure that we're not committing wholesale to a project without an opportunity to know have preconditions, post conditions been met, and do we have an, an opportunity to walk away. Some uh, a, a very useful figure, which I think most of you that have read earlier versions of the PEMBOT guide will be familiar with, is the wash tub figure of process groups. If you remember the wash tub figure, it was kind of that view where you were at the beginning of a phase, at the beginning and at the end of the phase. In between, there was what looked like a wash tub with all of your process groups swishing around like laundry. And what I loved about that was that it helped to reinforce the concept that process groups are not phases. It made it really clear that there was a lot of iteration. There was a lot of this compounding going on, that your processes weren't this linear progression. They've removed that or they dropped that figure. So for people that tend to be more visual, I think you've lost something of great value there. The content around organization structures has been expanded. They've gone beyond the old functional matrix projectized. They've now added in some more organic, virtual, hybrid, multi-divisional, which is really interesting. So they've kind of increased the, the, the taxonomies, if you will, of organization structures. What I really enjoyed was this role of the project management chapter. As I mentioned earlier on in the macro coverage, lots and lots of coverage of the importance of leadership, power, influence. On top of that, they looked at development and they tied it back to PMI's talent triangle. So I think you could really see in the PMBOK guide now a strong emphasis on what does PMI believe a good PM should be? What are some of those attributes and competencies they need to have? So great content added there. Let's start to go through our 10 knowledge areas now. So project integration management, which as we learn is the glue that holds together our remaining knowledge areas. They've now modified the components of the project management plan. In version five of the Pond PMBOK, they had 16 components. What they've done now is they've added three new components and they've eliminated one. So we're now left with 18 components to our project management plan. They've added a performance measurement baseline, which is the combination really, or an integrated view of your scope, schedule, and cost baselines. Effectively, they've brought together the three legs of the iron triangle into a single integrated view. That's what that baseline represents. They've added in project lifecycle description and development approach. This is essentially what are the phases your project is gonna go through, and what type of, de of a development approach are you using? Are you using an iterative approach? Are you using an incremental approach? Is it a waterfall approach? That's really what they're kind of looking at. One of the, the components that they eliminated is the process improvement plan, which as we remember, used to be part of what was generated in the quality management knowledge area. They've got rid of the process improvement plan. There's a lot more emphasis placed on tracking and logging and dealing with assumptions, as well as capturing and leveraging lessons learned. So you'll notice a lot more reference to the assumptions log in a lessons learned register. They have de-emphasized configuration management. And I actually like this change because I know for people that were taking the PMP exam, they were, so there was always a lot of confusion about, well, I kind of get change management, so what's configuration management? And it was a very gray kind of area. They've actually now de-emphasized it significantly. So I hope in the future that will translate into a reduction in the fear, uncertainty, and doubt around that concept as it pertains to passing the exam. 
One of the new processes they added, which I really liked, was the manage project knowledge process. This really highlights the importance that we need to be learning organizations, continuous improvement, how do we harvest knowledge from our projects. Great, great addition. They've added a lot more meat to the closed project or phase process, highlighting some of the important activities and the considerations when you look to close out a phase or a project. And what they've done is they've replaced the standalone business case and statement of work concepts with business documents as a more generic input for developing your project charter. This really acknowledges the fact that while business cases and statements of work are two examples that could be used as prerequisites to developing your charter, there are definitely other options which are used in industry across different organizations. Moving into scope management. Given that scope management does spend a fair bit of time talking about requirements as well as business analysis, they've now added a fair bit of content related to the interaction between the discipline of project management and the discipline of business analysis. They've also talked about the role of the business analyst, so they've expanded on what that role is. Minor little change, but you'll see it really throughout the guide. Where they used to talk about stakeholder management, they are now focusing a lot more on stakeholder engagement. The recognition being that we can't really manage our stakeholders. In fact, it's almost rude to think that we can manage our stakeholders. What we're really managing is our engagement or their engagement with our projects. And so the focus is on addressing that engagement, improving it. So that's where they change it from. Instead of trying to manage stakeholders, we're managing the engagement of those stakeholders. One which I was a little bit curious about was the scope baseline, as you know, in edition five of the PMBOK, three components of the scope baseline was your work breakdown structure, your work breakdown structure dictionary, and the project scope statement. What they've now added to the scope baseline is the concept of work package and planning package. Work packages, as we know, are the lowest level in your work breakdown structure. Planning packages are some level above the work package and some level below your control accounts in your WBS. They've actually pulled these out separately and said that these are part of the scope baseline. Curious, given that the WBS was part of your scope baseline. Not quite sure I understand the rationale behind that. When we look at schedule management, as I mentioned, they renamed the entire knowledge area from project time management to acknowledge the fact that we can't really control time. All we can control is our schedule. A change they made, which I believe makes a lot of sense, is they took the estimate activity resources project, which was once we had identified our activities and we had sequenced our activities, it was then starting to figure out the who and the what type of skills and how much of those skills we needed to deliver those activities. They've moved that process over to the project resource management knowledge area, acknowledging that this is really more about the resources and less about the schedule. There are some new tools and outputs that are discussed in this area. They've added agile release planning as a tool and technique, recognizing that how we plan releases in agile delivery is quite different than how we might do it in a traditional or waterfall type project. They've referenced our project management information system as a tool. They've also called out iteration burn down charts as tools as a method of managing your schedule or controlling your schedule, understanding where you're at. And they've included a very useful uh, output as being the basis of estimates, which is critical in the real world. When we, when we receive estimates from people or when we as sponsors are getting estimates from our teams, we want to know what was the basis for those estimates. So I think that was, those were very valuable additions. A couple of nice visuals that they added in this chapter, they put a, an example of Monte Carlo. So while they had described Monte Carlo simulation in earlier editions of the PEMBA guide, in this edition, they actually provide you an example showing how it could help you get an understanding of the range of outcomes given a set of variables related to schedule management. They also provided a really great visual that helps to compare and contrast the concept of crashing versus fast tracking when you're dealing with schedule compression. So as two different schedule compression techniques, how do I compare and contrast them? Great visuals there. Another thing they added, which I really liked, was that to the estimate activity durations process, 
they included a set of factors that a project manager or the team members might want to consider when they're doing estimation. One example of those is the concept of law of diminishing returns. For example, adding more resources to an activity, even if it's an effort-driven activity, might not give you the return you're really hoping for. As we know, lines of communication will scale non-linearly. If I just keep adding people onto a task, there is a point at which adding more people will actually cause that task to take longer than if I had left a shorter or more optimal number of resources on it. Moving to cost management. This was a little bit of a surprise. They dropped the use of the term PERT when referring to beta distributions. So the beta distribution, which is also known as the weighted average distribution, so the weighted average three-point estimate, as we know from our PMP studying, that's your best case plus your worst case plus four times your most likely divided by six. We used to call that the PERT estimate. That's how I had studied it back when I did my PMP in 2000. Well, they've dropped the use of the term PERT. So I'm guessing that in future versions of the exam, you're gonna see it referenced either as a beta distribution or as a weighted three-point estimate. In the determined budget process, they've added financing as a new tool, which makes total sense. If I've got some large capital project and we don't have the money in house to be able to deliver that project, I might need to use financing as a vehicle to be able to figure out what my budget is, what can I actually afford? So hence they added that as a tool. Here's one that I thought was a little bit of renaming for renaming's sake. Earned value management has now got broken out into two separate buckets. Earned value management has been broken out into earned value analysis, which focuses on things like calculating your plan value, your earned value, uh, maybe calculating out um, things like your budget of completion and so on. Whereas variance analysis is where we're finding things like our cost variance, our schedule variance, our CPI, our SPI, those are all showing up under variance analysis. Those have now been lumped under data analysis as a tool when we control costs. We've also added our project management information system as a key tool for control costs, which makes sense given that many, many times we're leveraging our underlying information systems on our projects to help us understand how are we doing cost financially relative to how should we have been. Quality management, this was a, an interesting chapter in terms of the changes. First, they got rid of the term quality analysis, perform quality analysis for the process. They renamed that to manage quality. Pretty interesting, given that I think that that's gonna create even more confusion for people between that process and the control quality process. So now that you have two processes that one is manage quality, the other is control quality, I don't know. I feel that that's a little bit harder to remember the difference than if they had left the name the way it was. They've made some pretty significant changes to the tools in this section. For example, for those of us that have got our PMPs, you'll remember the famous seven basic quality tools. Well, they don't reference the seven basic quality tools anymore. In fact, a number of those seven basic quality tools don't even get referenced in the chapter. They've dropped design of experiments as a tool in project quality management, but what they've added is design for X, DFX as a managed quality tool. Now, for those of you that don't know what DFX is, it's basically, if I have a particular variable or a constraint that I want to achieve, let's say I want to maximize fuel economy on my car, it's going to be how do I influence the other variables in my design to be able to maximize my fuel economy. They've also added meetings as a method or as a tool for control quality. An example of that being retrospectives or lessons learned could be a type of approach to control quality. So lots of changes you'll see in the project quality management chapter. Resource management. So what they did is they shifted from human resource management to resources in general. So they've included things like materials and equipment. This has resulted in all the underlying processes being renamed to de-emphasize human resources. The estimate activity resource process, as I mentioned earlier, was moved from project schedule management to project resource management. 
they've done a lot to de-emphasize what they had ca captured as disadvantages of virtual teams in the fifth edition of the PEMBOK. Now, this is only a suspicion on my part, but the rationale for that might be because virtual teaming is even more commonplace now than it was a few years ago, Therefore, and technology has certainly evolved or has matured significantly to start to bring down some of the disadvantages of virtual teams. So that might be one of the reasons why they de-emphasize putting a lot of content around the disadvantages of the virtual teams. They've added a new process that deals with physical resources, so our materials or equipment. This is called control resources. So this is different than our managed team. So the managed team process focuses on our human resources, control resources focuses on our physical or non-human resources. What I really liked was the plan resource management process. They've added a new output, which is the team charter. This is a great idea. I mean, certainly on agile projects I've been involved with, the concept of a team charter, how are we going to work together? What are those ground rules? How will we behave with one another? That to me is a great idea. And, I, and they've called that out, given that some air time. They've also called out communication technology as a tool for developing the team, recognizing that we leverage a lot of different communication technologies when we're looking at communicating with our, within our team and helping to develop the team. They've also called out emotional intelligence as a critical tool for managing the team. In the past, that had sort of been lumped under interpersonal skills. Now they pulled it out and they said, you know, no, this one's important enough. We need to talk about it openly. And again, that ties back to that earlier section or chapter about the role of the PM. They're really highlighting some of those soft skills. Communications management. This was an interesting one. It sort of felt a little bit like they were, they were, they were grasping for changes in here. They really tried to distinguish between the verb of communicating and the noun communication. So really starting to make that distinction. So one of the things that they did was they renamed control communications to monitor communications, that process. So recognizing again, that we're not trying to be dictators, we're not like gonna be, uh, be big brother, we're not controlling communications. What we're doing is we're really monitoring the communications on our projects. They took our basic communication model of the receiver or the sender and the receiver with the, uh, the encoding, decoding, and the medium, and they split it up into two different models. There's a basic model and an interactive model. The basic model is essentially a push type approach where as the sender, I'm sending you information, but I'm not actually getting something back from you. The interactive model is one where we get back the acknowledgement, we actually get maybe some need for clarification and so on. So they've done that sort of differentiation between the two models. They've added a little bit more information around communication methods, as well as interpersonal and team skills. Again, really valuable content to add. And they've added the tool of communication skills to managing communications. So I would say small changes, some of them pretty valuable, some of them you look at and you kind of say feels like they were just wordsmithing. Risk management. I felt for the most part, the changes to the risk management chapter were really valuable. They added a new process, which I think had been implied, but had never been explicitly called out since probably the second edition of the PEMBOK guide. This new process is called implement risk responses. So as you know, we develop our risk responses, but if we never execute those risk responses, if we never implement them, we haven't really addressed risk. And so they added in this new process for implementing the responses that we had developed. They also added in a new risk response for escalate. Escalate was a risk response that will apply to either threats or opportunities, negative risks or positive risks. The idea being that let's say we've identified a risk, maybe it's a threat. Within the context of the team, we know that we would really like to address it actively. Maybe we would like to mitigate it, but we simply do not have the wherewithal to do it on our own. Escalate would mean we're now passing it up to a much higher level of management to run with this risk. For example, you might have a risk that's more of an organizational systemic risk. I could escalate that up to my leadership team to run with it. Again, potentially a little bit of wordsmithing and one that I was not a fan of. The process that used to be called control risks has now been renamed to monitor risks. I'm not a fan of that because monitor to me feels passive. 
I would much rather prefer the control risks. Now their rationale, their rationale was we can't really control risks. Risks are uncertainty, they may or may not happen. We can't control that. What we can do is monitor them, we can try to influence them, hence they renamed it. But my worry is so many organizations do a poor job of risk management that by de-emphasizing the active, proactive nature of risk management, calling it just monitor risks, it almost feels like we're putting everything on a watch list. They added a lot of coverage on project risks themselves. So as opposed to focusing purely on individual risk events, the ones you find in your risk register, they also talked about how do we profile risk at a project level? They added a new, a new input called a prompt list. The prompt list is an input to identify risks. When I read the description of it, it really sounded similar to how you could use a risk breakdown structure as an input to identifying risks. A new output of identify risks was a risk report. So for most of us, we don't just hand our risk registers to our key stakeholders or to our senior managers. We likely distill that information into a format that's easily consumable. That's a risk report. A great addition was they added risk owners as a component of the risk register. Doesn't do us any good to identify risks and analyze risks and come up with risk responses if we haven't assigned ownership. They've now explicitly called that out. And they've added a fair bit of more content around the qualitative risk analysis tools. And I think that's really to acknowledge the fact that most of the time, most organizations struggle with doing quantitative risk analysis. And so if they don't have the historical data or they don't have the expertise to do quantitative risk analysis, at least there needs to be richer content or broader coverage of qualitative risk analysis. So that I think was definitely a step in the right direction. In procurement management, there was a shift away from the administrative aspects of handling contracts and agreements. So they dropped the closed procurements process and they kind of moved some of that content into the closed project or phase process. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that in most organizations, the administrative aspect of closing procurements is actually not handled by the project manager. It might be handled by a procurement analyst or by a procurement department of some kind. They've also moved away from the term administer procurements pro for that process, and they've called it control procurements, really focusing on that active role of the project manager, sort of being the large and in charge individual, not just a paper pusher. A new tool added for plan procurement management is source selection analysis. Valuable tool, certainly used it a lot in my past when I was doing contract management on projects. They've added another output to plan procurement management, which is our procurement strategy. On larger projects, you need to have a procurement strategy. How do we intend to do our procurements? What is our strategy for addressing our need for certain services or products? And I thought this was really great, especially for people that have never been exposed to procurement, is putting in a little bit more information about what is the difference between request for information versus a request for quotation versus a request for proposal. Great additions. Finally, when we look at stakeholder management, project stakeholder management, this is where we see that shift in emphasis from controlling our stakeholders, because again, these are human beings or these are organizational entities. We're not controlling them. We don't wield a lot of power over them. We're not gonna make them do things for us. That's not what project management's about. Instead, we're now looking at engaging with them and making sure we're engaging with them through the life cycle. So the plan stakeholder management process was renamed to plan stakeholder engagement. Similarly, control stakeholder engagement was renamed to monitor stakeholder engagement. One of the additions that I liked was that they have added a number of additional tools to support identifying stakeholders. For example, they added brain writing, which I absolutely love as a great means of overcoming some of the shortfalls or downsides of brainstorming. They also added the concept of directions of influence, which I was a new tool for me. So definitely some learnings there as well. And I think this makes sense that they would continue to augment this area. As we know, stakeholder management was a new knowledge area introduced in the fifth edition of the PMBOK guide. It makes sense that the sixth edition, they would start to augment the content there. So I would say probably you're gonna see some new questions showing up on the exam related to stakeholder management as a result of these additions. So let's move away from now the details of the guide changes themselves to, well, what does this really mean? Well, the PEMBOK guide was originally released in 1983, and 
whether an organization is blindly following it or not, it absolutely ends up being used as an input when organizations look to design their internal standards and methodologies. So what do I see the impact being on organizations? First of all, we're seeing, I would say, better alignment between theory and some real world best practices. They're starting to give you more examples. They're starting to be a little bit more pragmatic. You've got those tailoring considerations. You've got the emerging practices trends, you've got the agile and the adaptive in there. So they're really starting to bridge that gap between the fantasy world of PMI and how we manage projects in our day-to-day -day life. Tailoring, I think, is absolutely a step in the right direction. They need to take it further. I really hope that if they're going to grow the PMBOK guide in the seventh edition, the majority of that focus remains in the tailoring space. They've also provided an opportunity to take your existing methodologies and standards, and now because it's covering a broader set of content, you can really compare it against the guide and sort of see how are we stacking up. So I think maybe not from an official benchmarking perspective, but at least to get some sense as to how do we compare with what PMI would say. So before I get into the details around how this impacts those of you that might be interested in pursuing PMI designations, we've got another poll that we'd like to go over. So this poll is going to be asking you about your plans for any PMI designation. So if you're looking at earning, let's say your PMP or some other PMI designation, this is your opportunity to provide that input. Perfect. Okay, so as I've uh, shown here with sharing the results, um, got, a, got a reasonable percentage, about half of the audience is looking at pursuing some PMI designation. And uh, the majority of those that are looking to pursue a designation seems to be split almost 50-50 between the PMP and the PMI ACP, their Agile Certified Practitioner designation. Not really surprising because the ACP uh, is really one of those fastest growing certifications. I mean, if you think about how much it's grown since it was introduced just two or three years ago, it is absolutely increasing month over month. The CAPM is, uh, I don't know where it's gonna go. It's there as an entry level, but most people recognize that the real value is with the PMP or some of the other complementary designations. So again, not very surprising results. Well, what's this going to mean to you for those of you that are looking at pursuing a designation? Let's take a look at that. So the PMP, CAPM, and PMI ACP exams are going to be changing on March 26, 2018. So leading up to the launch of the PMBOK Guide 6th edition, PMI had been talking about sometime in Q1 2018. And for those of us that tend to be more risk averse or conservative, we were thinking, yeah, it's probably going to be January. Well, the good news is they've pushed that pretty much as far into Q1 as you can imagine. So it's March 26, 2018. Now, from a content perspective, for those of you that would be looking at pursuing your PMP designations, the exam content outline. Now, the exam content outline is a document which contains the domains and the tasks against which exam questions are written. The domains for the PMP are basically your five process groups in the PMBOK guide. It's your initiating, your planning, your executing, your monitoring, controlling, and your closing. Under each of those domains are specific tasks that a project manager is responsible for. When we write those exam questions, the exam questions are written aligned to those tasks and domains. Well, that content outline will not be changing because to change that outline, PMI actually has to do something which is known as a role delineation study. They look at the role of a project manager and they break it down, they decompose it into those domains and tasks. They haven't done a new RDS and so there won't be a new exam content outline. That's the good news. So that the eco isn't changing. However, the questions that are related to the exam content outline, because the PEMBA guide nomenclature has changed, because there's some new concepts, some new terms that have been introduced, those are all now fair game. Questions can be written related to those. If you're pursuing your CAPM, the exam content outline will have to change because that exam is 100% based on the PMBOK guide. So unlike the PMP, which draws on the PMBOK guide is just one of many, many references, the CAPM, the uh, CAPM designation uses the PMBOK guide as its sole source. And so the eco for that, the exam content outline is going to have to change. Right now, there's no news provided by PMI about the ACP eco. 
if I had to hazard a guess, given the timeline they're working towards, I don't know that they're going to have enough time to do a full role delineation study. So even though they released the new agile practice guide and they've added in all this agile content into the PEMBOT guide, I'm sure there will be changes to the ACP exam questions, but the actual outline that is used as, let's say, the skeleton against which those questions will hang, I don't know they have time to change that exam content outline by March 26, but we're gonna have to hold off on that as being conclusive until PMI advises accordingly. So what does this mean to you? My recommendation would be, if you're thinking about getting one of these designations, do it in advance of the change. Why do I say that? Well, historically, what has happened every time PMI has made a substantial change to one of their credentials or the exams for one of their credentials, there's usually a period of volatility where either the exam is ending up being too hard or too easy or the pass mark isn't quite right. They juggle or they tweak it for a period of time after the official cutover date. So recognizing that you're going into a period of greater uncertainty, my strong recommendation would be, we're really still in early October right now, you have ample time to be able to take your exam before that deadline. Now this does not mean wait till the last minute. A Couple of reasons for that. First of all, when you submit your application, your application could be audited. If it's audited, you gotta allow yourself potentially up to 90 days to get through the audit. That's one thing. Secondly, Let's say that you're not audited. Are you gonna get the date that you want given that the closer we get to the deadline, likely as not, a lot of procrastinators are gonna be trying to book exams at the last minute. So you probably don't wanna bank on getting an exam date anytime in March. You might wanna look a little bit in advance of that. And the third consideration is, let's say you're lucky enough to get an exam date in March. What happens if you fail? In that case, you're gonna be looking at rewriting the exam. If it falls after March 26, you might end up having to write on the new exam material. That would be a real shame. So my recommendation would be, even though there's still about four or five months to go, don't procrastinate. Jump on this as soon as you can. Strong piece of advice. If you are going to be writing your PMP, CAPM, or PMI ACP exams, I would recommend, especially for the PMP and the CAPM, if you're gonna write them before March 26, 2018, in other words, based on the, current, on the previous version of the PMBOK guide, do not download and do not read the new PMBOK guide. Because of the volume of nomenclature changes and process changes, if you start to read the PMBOK guide, you will confuse yourself. Stick to the fifth edition, prep course materials, online practice exams, all of those are gonna be geared towards the fifth edition until we hit the cutover point. So this table comes from PMI themselves. It comes from their registered education provider, Microsite. Gives you an idea as to when these changes are gonna be happening. So I've already mentioned 26th March, 2018 is that change date for your PMP, CAPM, and PMI ACP. I noticed that one of the folks uh, that had uh, contributed to the poll or participated in the poll was looking at a PGMP. They're announcing a date of Q1 2018 for the PGMP. Now, given that they released the standard for project now program management, the new edition at the end of September, I would be surprised if the change to the exam would happen earlier than the 26th of March 2018 date. So that's something where you'll have to stay tuned, but I would be pretty surprised if they would be able to get a date that's ahead of that 26th of March 2018 date. For those of you that have your portfolio management or are interested in pursuing a portfolio management credential, you're looking at Q2. And for the business analysis credential, that is still a TBD at this point. And the rationale behind both of those dates is because they have not released the updated edition of those guides yet. Paul, back over to you. Well, thank you very much, Kiran. That was excellent. Uh, we do have one question, more of a comment by one of the uh, participants. Uh, Mark says that uh, he believes that the uh, the work package and the planning package, having been added to the scope baseline, is probably a strong uh, hat tip to the agile iterative uh, delivery focus. Um, care to comment on that, uh, Kiran? That, that actually would make a lot of sense. I mean, starting to move away from this concept of traditional uh, requirements management, requirements definition down to the lowest level, um, 
starting to align better with the concepts of mid-level requirements, detailed requirements. I could see that. Yeah, it could potentially be a reason for that. Although if they were going to go that route, I would see it. I would have expected they would have shown some examples saying, you know, a work package would be like a story, maybe a, a planning package would be like an epic, something like that. They didn't do the, the, the explicit call out to Agile, but certainly that could be one of the reasons they did that. That might make sense. Okay, Paul, do we have any questions? We actually don't, Kieran. I think you did such a great job on explaining everything. There aren't any questions or you've overwhelmed them all. Either way, if anybody does have any questions, feel free to shoot uh, either Kieran or I an email. We'd be happy to address them. Uh, we uh, do want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day. This webinar has been recorded and we do hope to post it uh, uh, to make it available uh, publicly probably in a few weeks. Uh, so look out for that. And uh, we uh, will We'll also be happy to let you know of future webinars that we'll be offering. Uh, with that, uh, I don't see any other questions coming through. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody. Have a great day and good luck with all your present and future projects. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.